Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Death Wears a Gay Sport Jacket. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If you're crowded into a corner and can't fight your way out, call on me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, in the last month, violent death has struck four people in the Warrington Square section. Death in a gay sport jacket. I think I know who the killer is, but I can't be sure, and I'll never have a moment's peace until he's caught. The police don't seem to believe there's any connection between these four murders. That's why I'm hiring you. In close find the key. Find the key to locker 306 in the East Hempstead Railroad Station. The money you find there should pay your fee and expenses. It's yours whether you accept the case or not. <laughs> I leave that up to your conscience. Mm -hmm. I gather, Brooksy, there's no signature. No, nope. it's a generous amount of white space on the bottom, George. And the letter's typewritten. Our correspondent seems to revel in mystery. Well, here's something more specific. You might call it a postscript. Yeah. List of Warrington Square victims. Uh-huh. Well, whoever wrote this, he or she didn't have to go to that trouble. Jack Pringle on the morning bulletin has been repeating that list in bold type every day. September 12th, Joe Barcelona, butcher. September 17th, Mrs. Adelaide Walsh, housewife. September 29th, James O'Hara, truck driver. October 18th, Nancy Cabot, fashion designer. Four? Mm-hmm. I didn't know about Nancy Cabot, whoever she is. Hey, you know, Angel, this should be a pleasure. Multiple murder? No. A client who's willing to pay off without even identifying himself. Well, that is if there is any money in Locker 306. Well, Brooksy, there doesn't have to be any mystery about that. <laughs> Pacific Limited, leaving on track 14 in five minutes. Five minutes. Ah. You see, it is real money, Brooksy. This stuff in here isn't watercress. No. I can recognize the pictures of some of our nicest presidents. Uh, how about that? There's 300 bucks here. But how are you going to earn that lucre, George? Or don't you have a conscience? I don't know about a conscience, Angel. But I keep thinking about Nancy Cabot. Why is her name on that list? If anything has happened to her, why haven't we read about it in the papers? Valentine, believe it or not, when a crime is committed, the police somehow manage to hear about it. I told you there's been no report about a Nancy Cap. Okay, Lieutenant, okay. What do you make of this letter? Oh, we've been getting our share of love notes like that, too. Everybody has an idea who the man in the plaid sport jacket is. Why don't you check up on the delivery boy in our neighborhood? He likes plaid shirts. My neighbor has an uncle who isn't right in the head, and so on and so forth. Uh, well, it's not impossible that there is a character like that floating around. It's only possible when you have a mind like Jack Pringle's. Why, even I own a plaid sport jacket. Now we're getting somewhere. Oh, you're cute, Valentine. Well, after all, Lieutenant, people Look, did Miss see... Brooks, here's all I have to say, then I want to forget it. Joe Barcelona, butcher, has a brawl and ends up with a knife in his back. An old woman out walking her cat tells Pringle that she saw a guy in a plaid coat leaving the scene. Could be. Okay, so we're working on the case. And how about Mrs. Walt? Oh, that was no murder... The woman was up on the roof and decided to end it all. Ah, but Pringle. Pringle digs up a neighborhood character by the name of Mallory, who swears he saw the same fashion plate slinking away from the building. So right away, she was pushed off the roof. And that leaves James O'Hara. Yeah, I know, I know. This time, Pringle came up with a ham actor named Emmett Carey, who said the victim was shoved under a truck by the same plaid-coated individual. The medical examiner says O'Hara was plastered and didn't know where he was going. Now, can you blame me if I don't see eye to eye with Pringle? What does he care if he starts a minor crime wave as long as it builds circulation? Don't mind me, lousy Lieutenant. Loose. Don't mind me. Pringle, what are you, how did you get I in I just hit? walked in. You get steamed up like that, how do you expect to hear doors open? I don't know how you can stand it in here, Valentine, without your ears stopping. Get out of here. Now, you. hold on, Lieutenant. I'm just doing my job. Which is to repeat the same question I asked yesterday. 
What's being done to track down this sadistic monster in a gay sport coat? Now, look here, What's you... What's your interest in this case, Valentine? Oh, me? Oh, I'm always interested in the feet. Oh? Who are you working for? Well, even if I knew myself, friend, I wouldn't tell you. Oh, no offense. I, I just get paid to find out things. Now you found out, it's none of your business. <laughs> you know, sweetheart, one of these days, I'm going to have me a girl Friday just like you. You'd be surprised how women go for me. Women take to arsenic, too. But that's no recommendation for poison. <laughs> Very good, Miss Brooks. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm touchy, but it looks as though I'm not wanted. Oh, don't leave on our account, Pringle. We're just going. In case you want to know where, Miss Brooks has to see a lady about a cat. Young lady, it's very sweet of you to sign my petition. Oh, think nothing of it, Mrs. Winthrop. This but... city needs a home for stray cats. I've been waging this campaign for 20 years. Oh, to get back to Joe Barcelona, Mrs. Winthrop, how can you be so sure about the man in the sport coat? Wasn't it pretty dark that night? Oh, yes. But sometimes I do think I have the eyes of a cat, my dear. Do you believe in reincarnation? Do you think I might have some feline blood in me? Oh, I wouldn't know. Uh, just what did you tell Mr. Prince? Oh, he asked me so many questions, Miss Brooks. I'm certainly glad I was able to supply him the answers. Why, if there's a killer around, he may even decide he doesn't like cats. There are some people like that, you know. Well, um, thanks very much. Did you read what Mr. Pringle wrote about me in the paper? He called me the cat woman. Wasn't that sweet of him? Lieutenant Riley couldn't have said I swore on so anybody. You mean you're going back on your story, Mr. Malmo? Well, by no means. I'm just not a swearing man. Here, have one of my cards. What do you mean? What's it? If you ever feel like cussing, it's the devil in you fussing. I give on hundreds of those every day. Uh, that's well. Swearing destroys a person's moral fiber. It's worse than drinking. And talking about drinking, could you uh, spare a little change for a cup of coffee and... <laughs> I don't know what the end is with this other cup. <laughs> and I'll be switched. You, know, you see how you can express your emotions without resorting to profanity. Yeah, I'll make a mental note of that. Now, Mr. Mallory, how can you be so sure that the man you saw scuttling out of Mrs. Walsh's building after she fell to the street is one and the same as in the Barcelona case? After all, a lot of men wear plaid sport jackets. Oh, no, by jinkity. When Mr. Pringle was asking me all those questions, I realized that the coat was the exact same color and blue and green plaid. I see. Okay, if that's your story, I guess I'm stuck with it. Bye, Jinkity. No, Mr. Carey, I'm not a newspaper reporter. Oh, very unfortunate, Miss Brooks. I thought you might have some occasion to talk to Mr. Pringle and remind him that when he uses my name in his stories, it's spelled with two M's and two T's. <laughs> Emmett Carey. Uh, well, I'm just checking on that man you saw push Mr. O'Hara in front of the truck. Oh, I never said I actually saw this fiend do it. What I did say was that my powers of observation, developed after long years in the theater made me spot the culprit before he could beat a hasty retreat and so lose himself in the crowd. Oh? The garment he was wearing matched exactly the coat described by Mr. Pringle in his uh, newspaper uh, pieces. Then there's no room for doubt? None whatsoever. Oh, it was gratifying to see my name in the papers again. I can imagine. And well, you I... shall see it again and again, my dear. When I found just the right vehicle for my talent. Yes, yes, I'm sure of that. Now, I really must... You will remember to tell Mr. Pringle that there are two M's and two T's now, won't you? You don't know the time I had finding you, Miss Cabot. But I see you did. Is there any reason why you aren't listed in the telephone directory? Yes. Privacy, Mr. Valentine. 
I'm curious. How did you manage to locate me? Oh, I did a little checking. I happen to know you're a fashion designer. You seem to know a great deal about me. Including the fact that you're on somebody's death list. Oh, oh. oh come now. Isn't that a bit too melodramatic? Well, I got a letter from somebody who didn't sign his name. Call that melodramatic, too. But it had you listed as the fourth victim of this prowler in a plaid jacket. I'm glad to see that it was a mistake. Can there be any doubt that I'm very much alive? Well, even saying this was a crack note, you ought to be a little more concerned. Why your name, Miss Cavett? And you do live in the same neighborhood where our friend is operating. Sorry. Right now, I'm more interested in watering these flowers. Mr. Valentine, have you ever tried growing things in a window box? It's really a challenge. Is that all you have to say? Yes. Unless you're an authority on ivy geranium. You see... I I find it difficult to be hysterical about this apparition who's supposed to be haunting Warrington Square. Yeah, you and the police both. So far, you haven't produced anything spectacular to make me feel otherwise. No, I guess not. Look, um, I do appreciate what you're trying to be helpful, Mr. Valentine. I'd like to be helpful, too. Well? Talk to Jack Pringle. What about doesn't it seem odd to you that he's the one who always comes up with a witness and a detailed description of the madman? Yeah, I've mulled that over. It's possible a reporter might overwork his imagination to get a good story. Or he might have other reasons. Of course, I, I wouldn't know. I'm just trying to be helpful. Mm-hmm. Now, Mr. Valentine, it's getting late. I, I really must, must get dressed for dinner. I'd like to ask you to stay, but he happens to be something very special. My future husband, I hope. All right, good luck, Nancy. But just to make sure, you'd better find out if he owns a gay sport jacket. What took you so long up there, George? What does she have to say? Nothing particularly new, Angel, except a discourse on growing geraniums in a window box. Come on, let's go. Hmm. Well, aside from meeting a gallery of queer characters, we've gotten nowhere fast. Mm. George! Hey. Oh, that window box just missed hey, us. Back up against the wall, Brooksy. The lady has more than one of those up there. I'd feel better back in the lobby. I know I'm not going to feel better until I have another talk with Nancy Cabot. <laughs> Better get Riley on the phone, Angel. Oh, who could have gotten in here and choked her? You only left her a few minutes ago. I can think of three answers. Somebody who was waiting for me to leave. Somebody Nancy knew well. And somebody who had good reason to let fall with that window box. Well, now all we need is a witness to say he saw a man in a gay sport jacket. Yeah, well, get busy, Brooksy. Don't impede justice. Call the lieutenant. Well, what are you doing with that typewriter, George? Dear Mr. Valentine, in the last month... Oh, I get it. Was it Miss Cabot who wrote us that letter? On her own little typewriter, Brooksy. She was just a day early in writing her obituary. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about an important driving precaution. If you're planning a motoring trip, here's something you should do to make it a safe trip. Stop in at a standard station or independent Chevron gas station before you start out and have your tires inspected. If you find they're worn smooth, have risky cuts or bruises, don't take a chance. Play safe and get a new set of Grip Safe Atlas tires. The wider, skid resisting Atlas tread gives you greater driving protection. There's more rubber to grip the road to give you quick, safe stops and absorb road shocks. With each new Atlas passenger tire, you get a full year's written warranty against damage to the tire from road hazards. No wonder Atlas is the tire known nationally for its safety, long life, and economy. Another tip. When you're on the open road, keep safe by keeping the right amount of air in each tire. And that's a job for the folks at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. You get an unsigned letter and a list of four people who've met with violent death. In exchange for good legal tender found in a railroad station locker, you're supposed to come up with the murderer. If you're anything like George Valentine, the deal doesn't faze you. The 
Then you find one of the victims still alive. However, she doesn't disappoint you. You find the lady nicely throttled in her apartment which is where you are now with Brooksy and Lieutenant Riley. Valentine, if Nancy Cabot was afraid for her life, why didn't she sign her name to that letter instead of all this, this rigmarole? Well, don't you see, Lieutenant? She knew that if I took that job, I'd eventually get around to that fourth name on the list. Then she'd find out how I was doing without tipping her hand. Well, that's an answer, George, but it doesn't make, any, make it any simpler. Yeah. Nice having you on my side for a change, Miss Brooks. She was plain scared that this guy in the plaid coat would find out that she got in touch with me. There's nothing complicated about that. Huh? Another thing. All the time I was talking to her, I had the feeling she was trying to tell me something. But what? Uh, despite myself, I'm beginning to believe Pringle's story about the ghost of Warrington Square. Oh, not you, Lieutenant. Well, can you blame me? Valentine leaves the gal's apartment. She's choked to death. A flower box comes down on your head, and then... Then the killer disappears into thin air. If another neighborhood character says he saw a man in a gay sport coat coming out of the house... He'll have to explain why we didn't see him. Now, wait a minute, Pringle. You can't go in there. Never mind, Hennessy. Let him come in. Where is she, Riley? I've got to see her. She's in the next room. But you have no objection if the medical examiner looks at her first. Get out of my way. Wait a minute. What's the matter with you? You're crazy? I'll try to stop him. Hey, wait a minute, Lieutenant. You know the girl, don't you, Pringle? No. We're going to be married. What's that? You must have been the someone very special she was going to meet tonight. Uh, How do you know, Valentine? What were you doing here? Miss Cabot hired me to find this dapper murderer you've been writing about. Shouldn't have done that. She knew what it meant to me to prove I was right. She should have stayed out of it. Well, it's a tough break, Pringle, but don't blame yourself. You're right. I shouldn't. I should blame you. Now, wait a minute. If you'd done something, he never would have had a chance to kill Nancy. What makes you so sure it was our friend? Don't be naive, Valentine. This man is mad. This was his way of getting back at me. Oh, that's incredible. That's putting it mildly. But from here on in, Pringle, I'll accept your theory as fact and work accordingly. Oh, wait a minute. I know you're desperate, Lieutenant, but don't be rash. What's that supposed to mean? Well, as soon as I find out, I'll let you know. Say, George, there's a man in the outer office. He gave me this for you. Hmm? What? Do your bit for all humanity. Join the fight against profanity. Oh. <laughs> Don't you remember, Angel? I told you about Mr. Mallory. Bring him in. Oh, the characters in this case. This way, Mr. Mallory. Oh, yes, thank you, ma'am. What brings you here? I saw the picture of that girl who was murdered. You mean Miss Cabot? Yes. Here, Mr. Mallory, sit down. Make yourself at home. Well, come on, what about the lady? Well, uh, perhaps first we could talk about a little contribution to my anti-cussing campaign. Oh, the amount will depend on the information, so you'd better start talking. Well, it said in the papers that Mr. Pringle and Miss Cabot were so in love with each other, and we're going to get married. Love, marriage. That's the usual combination, isn't it? Well, a couple of days ago, they were together, and they passed me on the street. They were having a terrible fight. Oh? Yes, and you should have heard the words Mr. Pringle used. I was tempted to give him one of my cards. Do you remember what they were quarreling about? And she made it plain she was going to marry someone else. Hey, that would change the picture a little, George. Yeah. If it wasn't just a lover's quarrel. Yeah, Mr. Valentine, about mm. the... Uh... Oh, yeah. Hey, you are. you busy, Valentine? No, no. Come in, Lieutenant. Well, I thought we'd compare notes again, because this case is the darndest... Hey, Lieutenant, what you say? Huh? Yeah, take one of my cards. Oh, you and those... Those cards are... Well, thank you very much. I drive you crazy. You look tired, Lieutenant. Tired? Oh, I'm walking around dead. Well, here, relax. Take it easy. Look, Valentine, now look, we've had our differences, but I'm at a point now where I'll take suggestions from anybody. You know, that's a very reasonable attitude. Never mind that. Say, do you know anything I don't know? What did you mean in the cabin apartment about me not being too rash or something like that? Oh, George was just thinking of your blood pressure, Lieutenant. Nah, don't give me that. Come on, now loosen up, Valentine. Come on. Okay, maybe I can tell you something that'll make you feel a lot better. What's that? You don't have to worry about any more murders in Warrington Square. There won't be any. What makes you say that? How do you know? Well, for one thing... Ah, for the love. Okay, Angel, I'll take it. Hello? Who? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know all about you. What's that? Oh, that's fine, but just keep that to yourself till we have a chance to talk it over. Yeah, I'll be right there. Now, look, what were you going to say... What makes you so sure there's not going to be another murder? I'm afraid that'll have to wait now, Lieutenant. My optimism has suddenly waned. Carrie's room's 
rooming house is just on the next block, George. Hey, Brooksy, just how did this Emmett Carey impress you? You spoke to him. Oh, just an actor who probably sleeps with his scrapbook under the pillow. Seemed honest enough. Yeah, sounded like a screwball over the phone. Anyway, something must have happened to change his mind about seeing the man in the plaid coat. Well, if he told Pringle that, I can imagine how the demon reporter feels. Oh, oh golly, this is all we need. Who is this? The cat woman. If she starts talking, we'll never get out of here. Oh, one of my cats is missing Miss Brooks. Have you seen her? You couldn't help recognizing her. Her name is Bella. Oh, there hasn't been a cat in sight, Mrs. Winthrop. Now, we really I must... I can't understand it. Bella was such a well-adjusted cat. Have you seen her, young man? No, ma'am. Oh, no, she'll come back. Hey, oh, uh, Brooksy, don't you... My think... petition. Would you care to sign it, young man? I... To found a home for straight cats. Hey, Better Brooksy. sign it, George. Okay. Do you suppose, Miss Brooks, that man in the plaid coat could have lured Bella away? I've been thinking about it. <laughs> Oh, uh, George. We'll tell you later, Mother. Oh. Come on, come on, let me in here. Oh, I, I came out of the house and I really stumbled over it. George, it's Emma Carey. Hey, look, miss. Did you notice anyone else in the street when you came out? Oh, a man was just running around the corner. That's the man in the plaid coat. Brooksy, stay here till the police come. I'll be right back. <laughs> Hey, look, friend. A man came running into this block a few minutes ago. He had to pass here. Did you see him? You must have seen him. He... Oh. No. No, I wouldn't be able to see him. Oh, I'm sorry. Everybody around here knows poor old Joe can't see. You're looking for this fellow in a plaid coat, aren't you? He, he, he just passed here. Yeah. But how would you know that if you're blind? He stopped right in front of me here. You mean he told you who he was? Oh, he said everybody was looking for him, but they'd never find him. He said he wasn't through killing yet. He didn't care who I told that to. You know, he must be crazy. You're not kidding, Pop. Well, that's that. You're not going to stop looking for him, are you? He has a way of evaporating right in front of your eyes. Oh, you should keep after him. He ran down the street and went into that alley. You know, a fella like that shouldn't be around loose. Okay, this is for your trouble. Oh, God bless you. Don't mention it. Whether you know it or not, you may turn out to be the one to clean up this whole mess. And in this, the latest of the Warrington Square murders, the police have a blind man as the principal witness. Now maybe a blind man shall lead the police, etc., etc., well, that's a beautiful story you wrote, Pringle. What did you want me to do, Lieutenant? Shower you with compliments? Don't you feel out of things, not being the one to find the witness this time? Not at all, sweetheart. Seems I'm right in the middle of things. Tell me, Riley, why did you ask me down here anyway? I thought I wasn't welcome in your office. If you want to know, it wasn't my idea at all. All right, I'll guess who. Valentine, where is he? Oh, uh, he's here. Okay, Valentine. Yeah, over here, Joe. Take this chair. Be careful, now. That's all right, Mr. Valentine. You don't have to worry about poor old Joe. I can get around. So you finally decided to let the working press talk to your precious witness, eh, Lieutenant? That's right. I thought you'd like an interview. Yeah? I've got a few questions for him. Well, keep them under your hat, because Valentine here is going to ask the questions. Correction, please, Lieutenant. Just one question. Joe, you said the man in the plaid sport coat stopped and talked to you. Mm, that's right. Well, here's the question. Do you know who he is? Yes. It's... It's that fellow over there. Is he pointing at me? That's right. This was one time the power of suggestion couldn't work on a witness. You couldn't plant any ideas in Joe's mind as you did with the other three witnesses. Yeah, you must be hopped up, Valentine. You had to act out the myth you created because you thought he was blind. Put it. He's just a bad boy, Pringle. He doesn't like to work. There's nothing wrong with Joe's eyes. Oh, 
seem strange to be reading anything about the Warrington Square murders without Jack Pringle's byline on it. Yeah, well, it'd have to carry a city jail dateline, Brooksy. <laughs> the editor probably didn't think that would look dignified. Well, I hope you're pleased to see yourself in print, darling. Valentine suspected the blind man was a phony when the latter pointed out with such accuracy the path the fleeing killer took. Yeah, only one thing wrong with that story. They don't mention my name enough. Furthermore, Valentine... That's better. Valentine reasoned that Pringle could have instilled in the three earlier witnesses the conviction that they'd seen a man in the plaid coat when actually no such man existed. Yeah, but, Brooksy, they forgot to add that Pringle was lucky to find three people who were so susceptible to suggestion. A cat woman, a man with a crusade, a hammock. Mm -hmm. Pringle tried not to overlook a thing. He knew it would look too suspicious if the trail stopped abruptly after he killed Nancy Cabot. So he went on with Kerry to keep alive the myth of the killer in the gay sport jacket. Oh, uh, Angel. Hmm? I think I'll take Lieutenant Riley's suggestion and give that $300 to the police welfare fund. Oh, that's fine. But shouldn't we keep some of it for all the time and work? Oh, I forgot to mention this. I sold an exclusive first-person story to the Morning Bulletin for $500. <laughs> Why does the lady of the house defrost the refrigerator periodically? Because she knows that too much ice will prevent proper cooling. If she's wise and thrifty about the family car, too, she knows it's all important to get oil drains at regular intervals. That's because any oil used too long collects too much carbon and other engine killers. So if you've driven quite a spell without having the crankcase oil drained and replaced with fresh oil, take a tip. You'll get longer engine life by getting an oil drain at a standard station or an independent Chevron gas station tomorrow. For that's where they have RPM motor oil. RPM, you know, is compounded to keep your whole engine system cleaner. And that it certainly does when you get oil drains at regular intervals. Speedy oil drain service with premium quality RPM for your fresh oil is another reason all these stations say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, a new and intriguing letter will come to George's desk saying, Dear Mr. Valentine, for almost seven years I've been hounding a man who killed his own wife. Next week he's going to collect $200,000 because I failed. I need help and I don't mind admitting it. So how about giving me a ring? Signed, Samuels. Don't miss George Valentine's latest case, The Seven Dead Years, next Monday night. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Georgia Ellis as Nancy, Tony Barrett as Pringle, Peggy Weber as Mrs. Winthrop, Howard McNear as Mallory, Larry Dobkin as Carrie, and Dick Ryan as Joe. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.